Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is our eighth annual Feast of St. Francis lecture. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. King's is in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. So the feast day of the poor man of Assisi was, as you probably know, early in October, October 4, but we figure that October is, is game for celebrating Francis, so we're holding our Feast of St. Francis lecture on October 20. Francis is a saint with many associations. One is care uh, for the earth, another concern for the poor, a third interreligious dialogue, a fourth building up the church, a fifth peace. And so we've decided this year to foreground peace since Lord knows we could use help with that. So the lecture you'll hear, as you see, is entitled Just and Unjust Policing, Reflections from a Catholic Ethicist and Ex-Law Enforcement Officer. That Catholic ethicist and ex-law enforcement officer is Tobias Winwright, who is pictured, I hope, on your screens. I can see him. I hope everybody else can as well. Tobias is Associate Professor of Theological Ethics and Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University. He has a PhD in Moral Theology from the University of Notre Dame. In the 1980s, he worked full-time as a corrections officer in a maximum security jail. And in the 90s into the new millennium, he served as a reserve police officer for the Des Moines Police Department. He's published extensively on a wide range of topics, including the ethics of war and peace, environmental ethics, homelessness, capital punishment, and bioethics. Just to shame us all, he has two forthcoming books. I don't think that's really allowed, but he has two forthcoming books. One is entitled Serve and Protect, Selected Essays on Just Policing. The other is the TNT Clark Handbook of Christian Ethics. He's currently working on a new book, on just and unjust policing, Christian ethics and law enforcement, which will be forthcoming at some point from Georgetown University Press. We also um, are very fortunate to have a respondent, also pictured on your screen, M.T. Davila, who is associate professor at Merrimack College in Massachusetts. She was formerly associate professor of Christian ethics at Andover Newton Theological School, also in Massachusetts. Her publications and courses focus on immigration, racism and racial justice, class and inequality, Catholic social teaching, and to the point for this evening, the ethics of the use of force. She's the co-editor of Living Without Borders, Catholic Theological Ethics and the Movement of Peoples, and she is the president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States. So I want to thank both our presenters this evening for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias and MT. So before I, I turn the floor over to Tobias, just some nuts and bolts. This event is being recorded, and maybe in a couple of days or so, that recording will be available. I'll post it on the center's Facebook page, which is um, located at www.kings.edu backslash ethics, or you can simply search on Facebook. I'll also start uh, posting recordings on the McGowan Center's YouTube site. Um, and at some point or other, I'll be able to tell you what that www is. So look for those videos sometime soon. If you happen to be able to unmute yourself, please don't. If you happen to be able to turn on your video, please don't. For purposes of our Q&A, please send all questions through the chat to me, Bernard Prusak. All right, so Tobias, take it away. Thank you again for being with us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Prusak, for your warm welcome and kind introduction, as well as for your generous invitation to present this Feast of St. Francis Lecture for the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. I truly wish I could have come there in person, but I guess doing so remotely is better than nothing. Still, it would have been nice to see some friends who teach and work there, including Janice Thompson, Anna Minori, uh, Joel Schumann, and Bill Bowen. To be sure, it is an honor to be scheduled and included among an excellent lineup of lecture topics that you have this fall. I wish to express my appreciation in advance also to my respondent, M.T. Davila, for her willingness to do so 
And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us online this evening. Here are some names that may be familiar to you, although sadly so. 22-year-old African-American woman, Rakia Boyd. She was killed by an officer in Chicago on March 21st, 2012. 43-year-old African-American man, Eric Garner, killed in New York City, July 17th, 2014. 22-year-old John Crawford III, killed in Beaver Creek, Ohio, near Dayton, August 5th, 2014. 18-year-old Michael Brown, killed in Ferguson, Missouri, near St. Louis here, August 9th, 2014. 12-year-old Tamir Rice, killed in Cleveland, November 22nd, 2014. 32-year-old Philando Castile, killed in St. Dakota, July 6th, 2016. 15-year-old Jordan Edwards, killed in Balch Springs, Texas, April 29th, 2017. 26-year-old Brianna Taylor killed Louisville, March 13th, 2020. And 46-year-old George Floyd killed in Minneapolis, May 25th. And 29-year-old Jacob Blake killed in Kenosha, Wisconsin, August 23rd, 2020. All these black persons were killed by police in recent years in the United States. And this list is not exhaustive. In fact, in 2018, U.S. police killed at least 992 people. U.S. police killed 995 people in 2015, 963 in 2016, 987 in 2017. 25% of those killed had mental health problems. Police are twice as likely to kill unarmed black men than unarmed white men. Did you know that Christians in the United States overwhelmingly support the police. Christian support, however, shifts along racial lines. 70% of white evangelicals, white mainline Protestants, and white Catholics say the police are doing a good job or excellent job. However, 55% of black Protestants view the police as doing a lousy job. Despite lower black support, overall support for police rose nearly 14% during the three years that videos began surfacing of officers killing unarmed black men. As a Christian theologian and ethicist, I find all the above statistics and numbers to be deeply troubling and disturbing. And as a former corrections officer, reserve police officer, and police ac academy ethics instructor, I find these figures to be even more troubling and disturbing. As Dr. Prusak mentioned, I first started in 1984, in a sheriff's department in Pinellas County, Florida. The photo on the left is me graduating from the academy. That is my mother in between us. She was a patrol officer and she became a homicide detective. She retired several years ago. The photo on the right, that's me as a reserve police officer in Des Moines and that is my wife next to me. So there's just the evidence, the pictures to show you uh, my background. Especially when I was um, first starting in the 80s, I remember wrestling with the question, you know, what would I do? Would I use lethal force on the job if necessary? And maybe you've heard the phrase w, uh, WJD. It's not we want Jack Daniels. It's what would Jesus do? And as a, a Catholic Christian growing up, I wrestled with that question on that particular job. On August 9th, 2014, when I first heard on the local St. Louis news about how 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot to death by police officer Darren Wilson in nearby Ferguson, I initially had two concerns. First, based on the eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts at the time, I wondered whether Wilson's lethal actions were justified in accordance with use of force guidelines and jurisprudence. The second concern was race. Most citizens in Ferguson are African Americans, and most of the police there are not. That the Ferguson Police Department, according to its chief at the time, employed three black officers and 47 white officers in a town that is 68% African American should have indicated a race problem to begin with. Of course, race is not an issue only for Ferguson. When I worked in law enforcement, I knew some racist officers. 
I remember one in the mid 1980s who during roll call boasted about receiving a thank you note and a flag from the South African government in response to a letter he had sent there supporting their policy and practices of apartheid. I thought he was, as it is often said, merely one of the bad apples. I'll come back to that phrase later on. During the protests that happened in the following days, a third concern arose. When I saw the St. Louis County Police and its military equipment, the helmets, the camouflage uniforms, and especially that sharpshooter you see there in the bottom right hand corner of this slide, on top of an armored vehicle, aiming his rifle at the people who were protesting, I said to my wife, this is bad, and it may turn out to be very bad indeed. At Christ the King United Church of Christ in nearby Florissant, Senator Claire McCaskill received a standing ovation when she told the crowd that St. Louis County should demilitarize the police response in Ferguson. Afterwards, she told reporters, the police response has been part of the problem. I agree. The militarization of the police correlates with an overemphasis on the use of force. And when the thin blue line resembles an occupying force, it exacerbates racial tensions. It only makes things worse for everyone, including the police. Because of my background, the Christian Century magazine asked me to write an article about this link between police militarization, unjust use of force, and racism. That's the cover of that issue. Actually, someone saw this at the White House, and for months after this was published, I was included in um, conference calls with the Department of Justice, uh, including with Valerie Jarrett and um, uh, uh, General uh, Attorney um, Eric Holder. And so uh, they had this program about trying to reform the police, and they realized that this was a problem here, the militarization. More recently, on May 25th, George Floyd, a 46-year-old African-American man, was killed in Minneapolis during an arrest for allegedly using counterfeit $20 bill. When I saw the video footage of white police officer Derek Chauvin holding his knee on Floyd's neck for nearly eight minutes, as Floyd echoed Eric Garner's, I can't breathe, I felt appalled. Even if Floyd had resisted, Chauvin's knee on his neck went beyond subduing, which is what police are supposed to do, to punishing, which the court system is supposed to do. I have never seen such a callous and heinous act by a fellow officer, even though I indeed have witnessed brutality, racism, and excessive force in my experience. A few months earlier, on March 13th, Louisville police officers in the early morning hours with a so-called no-knock warrant, forced entry into Brianna Taylor's apartment. When her boyfriend, who did not know it was the police, believed his or her lives were in danger, he fired a shot, hitting one of the officers in the leg, according to the officials. The police fired 32 shots in return. The boyfriend was unharmed, but Taylor was struck by six bullets and died. Between 2010 and 2016, at least 94 people died during the execution of no-knock search warrants, 13 of whom were police officers. As with other uses of force in the criminal justice system, no-knock warrants are disproportionately used against suspects of color because the so-called war on drugs from its inception has disproportionately impacted people and communities of color. During the past summer months, not even a pandemic could occlude the protest proclaiming Black Lives Matter. This righteous refrain is clearly justified, but see, what seems less clear is this movement's expectations for policing in the United States. Unlike earlier incidents of police violence against Black persons where attention was devoted to reforming the police, calls for defunding and abolishing the police instead of right, resounded throughout the media. Yet, on the one hand, defunding and abolishing are not the same thing. I know one of the slides has a photo of both signs there at the same time. On the other hand, abolitionists are not in total agreement about what their call entails either. One writer suggests we must imagine a world without policing. 
and another seeks to eradicate this Jim Crow system of public safety that is policing as we know it, end of quote. But have police always and everywhere been like this? On the left of this slide, you have Bobby's British police. On the right are some of the slides I just showed you. Quite a difference, and I've been to the UK a number of times, even during high alert terrorism moments, and they do not look like the police here in the United States. I'm no longer a law enforcement officer, obviously, but an ethicist and a theological ethicist at that. I pursue questions such as what is going on? What ought we be? Who ought we be? What ought we to do? And to borrow a term from rock climbing, the handholds I will use in this presentation tonight as a Catholic theological ethicist are some relevant principles of Catholic social teaching. The two primary problems to be addressed in policing in the United States today are first, militarization of the police, and second, systemic racism of the police. I want to consider what kind of policing we ought to have and suggest what police ought to do concerning the use of force from a Catholic moral perspective. One of the reasons I went to Notre Dame during the 90s was to research the ethics of policing from a Christian theological perspective, since I wrestled with that question on the job. And that research ended up being my dissertation the challenge of policing and analysis in Christian social ethics. Curiously, I discovered that this is a topic that has received very little, if any, attention from theologians, ethicists, and bishops. When violence is addressed, it tends to be in connection with war, self-defense, capital punishment. When criminal justice comes up as a topic, it tends to be about the death penalty and about prisons. But policing has been a lacuna which is curious given how the use of force has been a significant question throughout the history of Christianity. As Lisa Sol Cahill of Boston College observes, the challenge to decide about violence, especially state-supported and institutionally perpetuated violence, has been with Christians from the beginning. Likewise, Stanley Harawas of Duke claims that the question of violence is the central issue for any Christian social ethic. Of course, like policing, racism also has been neglected in Christian theology and ethics, especially by white theologians like me. Black theologian James Cone once wrote, if one read only white Catholic theologians, one would hardly know that blacks exist in America or that they have the capacity for thought about God. Black theologians like him, however, have been dealing with these questions, including police brutality, for decades. Still, the police really have not been the focus of attention for most theologians and ethicists. Most Christian theological ethicists became interested in the police after the terrorist attacks on 9-11, almost 20 years ago, including a number of pacifist and nonviolent theologians and ethicists, including Stanley Harawas and Sojourner's Magazine, Jim Wallace, they proposed a police type of response rather than going to war for dealing with terrorists, sort of akin to how the Korean War was called a police action. You see there Stanley Harawas, who is a pacifist against violence, he thought that a police approach might be better. And he said he would support it if it up to a certain point, and that point being carrying a gun. Quakers Tom Ryan and Matt Riley reflect this move. They tended to think that a police approach to dealing with terrorism might be a good thing. But you can see here that they also had hesitations and reservations about it. As Matt Riley said there at the bottom, uh, he felt that a limited police action type of war might be justified, but he added, I feel less Quakerly about it. So this is an important question. And yet it is curious, no one has really written about it from a Christian moral and ethical perspective. And these references to policing that Wallace and, and Harawas and these Quakers made kind of assume that it's a good thing, that it's better than war and the military. And yet that word is sometimes used in negative ways too. After all, no one wants to live in a police state, do they? 
In his 1973 classic work on just war theory, Harvard ethicist Ralph Potter observed, seldom have American Christian scholars addressed themselves seriously to the task of helping public officers reflect upon the mode of reasoning appropriate to their office that would guide them in determining when they should act, how they should act, and why. Potter firmly believed that police officers need ethical guidance to help them to understand and evaluate carefully and critically the use of force in a way that coheres with moral principles. No theological ethicist devoted attention to the concerns raised by Potter until 1982, when Notre Dame's Edward A. Malloy published his thin volume, The Ethics of Law Enforcement and Criminal Punishment, which included in it as its first chapter a brief treatment of the ethics of use of force. And he said that, he noted that there's a deficiency in this. He didn't really address it very much. And he hoped that his little effort would encourage others to pursue this topic. One does not need to start from scratch though. In recent decades, criminologists have identified and proposed several models of policing. John Kleinig, portrayed here, is a philosopher specializing in criminal justice ethics at John Jay in New York City. And there's his book, The Ethics of Policing, published by Cambridge. In it, he examines the moral foundations of policing and the specific problem of the use of force. He identifies various models of policing that are currently extant extant amongst criminologists, along with their correlative perspectives on the use of force. Indeed, there is a spectrum of policing models offering various normative frameworks for policing and the use of force, in which different philosophers, sociologists, criminologists have been advocating. The two main models at opposite ends of the spectrum from each other are the crime fighter or military model and the social peacekeeper model or community policing. Falling somewhere in between these two, are the emergency operator or firefighter model and the social enforcer model. The primary model of policing that has developed and prevailed amongst police in the United States during much of the 20th century has been the crime fighter or military model. Kleinig notes that this is a model in which the use of force is central. Jocelyn Pollock Byrne says that police take very seriously their role as crime fighters, so much so that this shapes and forms their self-understanding. When referring to real police work, they generally have in mind crime fighting, with the use of force as central to their job. Egan Biltner writes, the conception of the police as a quasi-military institution with a warlike mission plays an important part in the structuring of police work in modern American departments. Not only do American police tend to regard themselves as crime fighters in the war on crime, but Jerome Skolnick and James Fife observe the military metaphor also colors the public's expectation of the police. Americans are likely influenced by popular depictions of policing on television and in movies, which focus more on crime fighting. Audiences of television, dramas, and movies often see heroic males regularly and successfully using lethal violence as a way of avenging wrongs conveying the message that violence, especially with a gun, is a way of life in America for dealing with interpersonal conflict and social problems, including crime. The police, too, are affected by these portrayals. And this has become core, in their view, of what they are all about. Peter Scharf and Arnold Binder name these depictions the mythology of police work, especially with regard to viewing the gun as a primary symbol of law enforcement the tool of the trade, the culturally defined essence of police work. More recently, Radley Balco, in his book, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, has documented this trend in US police history. As he observes, no one made a decision to militarize the police of, in America. The change has come slowly, the result of a generation of politicians and public officials fanning and exploiting public fears by declaring war on abstractions like crime, drug use, and terrorism. The resulting policies have made those war metaphors increasingly real. Balco surveys how such martial language came to shape policing, not only how police officers came to view themselves and the work, but also the public's expectations of law enforcement. From Richard Nixon, who was the first to refer to the war on drugs, to Ronald Reagan, to George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush, 
The militarization of the police coincided with these so-called wars underway within the domestic United States. There's also been developments with police departments, especially after 9-11, obtaining more military equipment from the Department of Homeland Security. So that we have SWAT teams now that look like military more and more, and we have even police departments in small cities, large towns that have military equipment and SWAT teams. This view of policing, again, assumes the primacy of force in coping with crime and criminals. It's the raison d'etre of policing. And several criminologists have actually said that this has a causal connection, that there is a causal connection between the idea that cops are like soldiers in wars on crime and the use of excessive force. Now that's not the only model of policing. And I'm gonna skip across the other two in the middle and go to the one at the opposite extreme for the sake of time. At the opposite extreme is the community policing or the social peacekeeper model that John Kleinig advocates. In this model, the use of force is instrumental. It's a tool rather than the essence of policing. In this approach, it is one instrument amongst other. It acknowledges still the non-negotiable force at police disposable, but does not transform it into the police raison d'etre. In Kleining's view, the social peacekeeper model better encompasses most of the responsibilities and tasks of police and society. And in this model, the fact that the police are armed is a contingent matter. In this way, although there remains a place for the possibility of the use of force against an uncooperative or threatening suspect, its instrumental or subservient character is emphasized. The use of force is a last resort. Finding also regards this model as more faithful to the historical roots and practices of policing in England. Indeed, police have, as we know it did not begin until 1829 with the founding of the new police of metropolitan London by Sir Robert Peel, that's where we get the name Bobby, Robert, in 1829 in London. Prior to that time, the function of policing was performed in ancient Rome by soldiers and by the guards and by the vigiles. Elsewhere, there were night watches and in England where there were the constables and the shire reeves, what we call sheriffs. With the industrialization and urbanization of the 18th and 19th centuries, there was plenty of turmoil, and increasing crime, and there were riots, and the night watchmen and constables weren't able to deal with this. So Sir Robert Peel proposed the organization of the first modern police department. According to Peel, the basic mission for which police exist is to prevent crime and disorder as an alternative to the repression of crime and disorder by military force. Prior to the new police, when there were riots, the military would come in and there was a lot of violence. The police were not supposed to employ that approach. They were an alternative. There were doubts and fears amongst the population at first. So Peel was stubborn to the point of, of obsession that his new police should be seen to be free of all taint of militarism. That's why he made them wear a quiet uniform, he said, consisting of a blue shallow tail coat with white buttons rather than the British military's red coat. Even then, at first, the new police were called derogatory epithets such as blue locusts, blue drones, and blue devils. To counter these concerns, Peel emphasized the primary object of the first police department was the prevention of crime using persuasion and physical force is only a last resort and only the minimum necessary for stopping a breach of the law. More importantly, in Peel's approach, the police would be citizens working in partnership with their community. A considerable part of their patrol duties involved publicly walking beats in the neighborhoods, traffic control, feed the children and animals, finding missing persons, care of poor and destitute people, extinguishing fires, inspection of weights, bridges, and buildings, and even waking people up for work. As such, London Metropolitan Police were proactive rather than reactive. 
And only within this overarching community peacekeeping frame, framework were the new police required occasionally to stop a crime in progress and to use force to apprehend criminals. As one researcher historian notes, when a riot broke out at Hyde Park Corner in 1830, the mob was met only with passive police resistance, a tactic which seems to have bewildered the rioters who bent on violence were hoping for violence in return. Actually, one of the police officers who responded to that was killed. And that gained the sympathy of the British public. This approach to policing was transplanted to the United States, beginning in New York in 1845, followed by Boston and Philadelphia. Though in the South, policing's roots were connected more with the slave patrols and much more so with racism. Even so, when police began to wear uniforms and a badge in the 1850s in the United States, many Americans worried that the police would turn out to be essentially another standing army, though police departments did not recruit from the military at that time. According to Robert Fulkerson, Americans had a strong conviction that the police should have an essentially civilian orientation. The ethos, however, changed after the Civil War when the surplus of firearms began to find its way into the hands of the police. Then in the early 20th century, during the 1920s, with well-armed gangsters like Al Capone, the police also began to arm themselves even more. In addition, as one police abolitionist correctly notes, during the Jim Crow era, when many black Americans moved from the South to Northern cities, Northern police often parroted their Southern counterparts and were not unsullied by white supremacy. This combination has led us to where we're at today with police militarism, police racism, and excessive force. Findings call for the social peacekeeper model of policing, attempts to reclaim key elements and practices of policing that were emphasized in the genesis and much of the first century of modern policing. By situating policing within this social peacekeeping context, he believes that crime will be more effectively dealt with and the use of force by police will be less likely and less excessive. My point with this cursory account of these four models of policing and policing's history is this. Not all of it had to do with anti-Black racism, white supremacy, and militarism. As a human construct, policing as we know it neither had to be this way, and nor does it have to continue to be so. Moreover, although some abolitionists call for a world without policing, a comparative analysis of the police in other democratic nations around the world reveals that this institution is not as univocal and its practices are not as universal as abolitionists may assume. Yes, there are bad police departments elsewhere, but there are also good examples. Recent studies remind us that not all police elsewhere are armed like American police. In my trips to Ireland, the Garda, they don't even train with the use of lethal force like we do here. They are not armed like we are here. Nor are all departments elsewhere organized like ours here. Not all recruits are lacking in higher education and training in de-escalation techniques like their counterparts here in the United States. Thus, I am more supportive for the calls to defund the police if it means reallocating funds, redistributing funds to other programs that will address root causes that give rise to violence and to crime. In June, the New York Times called available data and estimated that the police spend roughly 4% of their time addressing violent crime. Most of their time is spent dealing with non-crime fighting matters. To be sure, some of these services provided by the police may be done better by other agencies or professionals, such as mental health professionals. The collaboration between the police department and the mental health first responders organization, CAHOOTS, in Eugene, Oregon, is a prime example. Still, this does not entail the abolition of the police. One CAHOOTS member, Henry Cakebread, says, quote, it's funny because we're lately presented as an alternative to the police, but we couldn't do our job without the police. They underscore our safety. Police are still needed in dangerous instances, including during suicide attempts and domestic violence situations. Moreover, there will also continue, at least in the United States, to be instances where there is no time to call for a timeout to defuse a situation, as in when there is an active shooter. 
Part of the problem is our prevalence of guns in this society, if you haven't noticed my hinting at that throughout this presentation. Other policing reforms are underway and moving in the right direction. The city of Louisville passed a new law earlier this year named after Breonna Taylor that bans the use of no-knock warrants. Other significant reforms include banning chokeholds, prohibiting racial profiling, establishing citizen police review boards, providing officers housing credits to live in the neighborhoods where they police. It is designated that the state's attorney general be the one to investigate police shootings and reconsidering the legal doctrine of qualified immunity as law and policy. My St. Louis University colleague, Roger Goldman in the law school has also encouraged police licensing to help prevent officers who have been fired or who have resigned from a department for using excessive force from getting hired at another police department elsewhere. As he puts it, if the state can take away the license of a barber for misconduct, surely it should be able to do so for a police officer. In addition, we must reverse the Trump administration's reversal of the demilitarization of US police departments that began under the Obama administration after Ferguson. Getting the police on board is crucial though, and the police unions are an obstacle at present. Although Catholic social teaching supports the rights of workers to organize through unions, I do not see how police unions today have anything to do with organizing against economic exploitation. Instead, they serve and protect the power and interest of the status quo. To be sure, some abolitionists might judge that these reforms are surface level remedies and therefore incapable of counteracting a systemic, deeply ingrained culture of anti-blackness in police departments. I agree that the deeper problem is cultural and systemic. Recently, when called to jury duty for a criminal case involving the testimony of three police officers versus a black female defendant here in St. Louis, the prosecutor said to me during the Boyer Dyer, knowing that I used to be a former law enforcement, he said, of course you know that there's always some bad apples, right? I replied, that may be the case, but sometimes the tree itself is diseased. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that the entire orchard or orchards elsewhere are so diseased. The root of the disease though, at least here in the United States, is the racism, militarism, and fundamentalism that are coursing through the veins of our society. And unfortunately, the police reflect all of this. In June of 2017, 2017, at an audience with Pope Francis in Vatican City, Italian police officers were thanked for their service by the Pope. The Pope emphasized to them, quote, your vocation is service. And he highlighted how their mission as police officers is expressed in service to others through their constant availability, patience, the spirit of sacrifice, and the sense of duty, end of quote. To cultivate such a culture of policing, one that bends towards what Gerald Schlaubach and I have called just policing will require many changes in academy and field training, as well as with recruiting from the community. The social peacekeeping model, in my view, is consonant with Catholic social teaching on protecting human dignity, on the common good, and on, as St. Francis of Assisi said, peace. That should be our story, starting point. And I think the social peacekeeping model is a good place to begin. Peace be with you all, and thank you very much.